uh, I'm Michele Tomea from uh, Thai Italian Chamber of Commerce located in Bangkok. Today we have uh, an exclusive uh, uh, speakers with us, professionals from uh, Nielu uh, Diversified Solution. Uh, we host uh, Ms. Laura Mittelstedt and uh, Uche Nemchuku, both partner of Nielu Solution. Um, the topic, as you saw today, we are talking about the business case for supporting women in workplace. Um, our speakers, uh, our two professionals will give you insight uh, about uh, uh, employment, uh, uh, legal uh, situation that you might encounter, uh, that uh, will be beneficial for the employee and also for the employer. Um, you can drop uh, also your inquiries and questions in the chat that you might be able to see in the bottom part of uh, your icons for Zoom. Uh, my team and I will help you in the Q&A session after the two presentation to uh, deliver your inquiries uh, to uh, Laura and Uche. Just a quick overview now about uh, Nelu. Uh, as I said, uh, Nelu is uh, a women and minority owned boutique consulting firm uh, located in Chicago. Uh, the team uh, of Nelu working from big law uh, firm, benefit consulting, global corporate and human resources and healthcare uh, companies. Uh, now that they have uh, uh, these consulting firms, they help uh, employers deliver and communicate programs that are meaningful and valuable for employees. No matter their age, race, gender identity, sexual orientation, or family status. The team of NELU is the result of a data driven, helping to identify gaps, measure change, and optimize spend. So now, with no much further ado, I would like to give our virtual stage to Laura Mittelstedt. She will be our first speaker. Uh, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Uche. The stage is all yours. Perfect. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. We are so excited to be here with all of you this morning. Uh, we are both very passionate about all things diversity, equity, and inclusion, and especially uh, women's topics, and especially what um, value can be brought to companies and organizations by focusing on best supporting women. So, you know, Mickey just did a wonderful job of providing a brief overview about NALU. And Uche, if you can go to the next slide, we'll provide a little bit more background. All right, so like, Nick, like Mickey mentioned, we are a boutique consulting firm based in Chicago. We focus specifically on helping our clients with their diversity, equity, and inclusion practices as it relates to their talent strategy, and particularly around benefits and well-being programs. One of our focuses in that space is helping employers reduce and optimize the cost of the programs that they offer um, to make sure that they're getting the most out of the expenses that they have in that space while also giving the most value to their employees that they're working to support. Like Mickey mentioned as well, we are multidisciplinary and we have hands-on experience in all of these different topics related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and today we'll be specifically speaking with you about our expertise in topics surrounding women in the workplace. Uh, um, just really quickly before we dive into the meat of the presentation, we wanted to share a little bit about the, the values that we hold as an organization and the way that we think about supporting our clients as well as the ways that we think about supporting our staff. And you'll see that some of the themes that I touch on here will be things that we mentioned throughout and will feel consistent throughout the conversation today. So first, something that we think about a lot is designing people-centric programs, policies, and communications. We really think about the human impact and the human aspect of everything that we do. We also talk a lot and think a lot about what we can do to influence systems to help overcome bias and think about making some of these broader shifts around diversity, equity, and inclusion 
issues on more of a macro level versus on an individual level. And we'll talk about that more later today. And then we also really focus on helping to make employees feel valued. That's something that is important for us with our own staff where we really focus on wellness and making sure that employees have flexibility and are able to manage their work life well. Um, but just in general with everything that we do, the programs that we support our clients with, really thinking about employees and, and how they can best be supported by and benefit from um, their companies is very top of mind for us. Go ahead, Uche. Now I'll, I'll pass it over to Uche to start to talk a little bit about the business case for supporting women in the workplace. Thank you, Laura. Um, so hi everyone, like Laura said, we're in Chicago. Um, so it's 10 PM here <laughs> and I wanted to have, um, my Nalu background, but for whatever reason, it wasn't working. So you see the back of my office. Sorry about that. Um, so like Laura said, we're really happy to be here and um, before we talk about the ways to support women in the workplace and to enhance their experience, let's dig into the business case. So I would be remiss if I didn't say we should support women in the workplace because it's the right thing to do, <laughs> but there are real benefits to it um, in the form of social capital um, and actual capital. So <laughs> let's talk through some of those things. So starting with the business case, the important thing to understand is that how employers treat women in the workplace um, really matters in the marketplace, especially now. And this is across the globe. It really matters in the marketplace people are paying attention. So that means your workforce is paying attention. Um, your workforce is invested in the culture. If the culture is not um, what they're looking for, if the culture is not supportive, they're not going to stay. And that's expensive when, you're, when you have a revolving door of employees and especially a revolving door of women is what we're finding. In addition to that, your customers care. Your customers really care. So a good reputation um, means better social capital um, and a better bottom line when it comes to customers. Customers are paying attention and customers are also more vocal. They're using social media, et cetera, to call out companies when their culture is not in line um, with their customers' beliefs. Finally, investors. Investors are really starting to pay attention because those who are using, those who are investing in the funds that these investors um, are promoting or selling, um, and those and the investors themselves, if they're individual investors, are starting to pay attention to the social aspects of what they're investing in. So at the end of the day, all three of these points matter. And at the end of the day, all three of these parties are really paying attention to the way that we treat women in the workplace. So I wanna talk through more specifically about the economic benefits to supporting women in the workplace. So what we know is that what we know and what the data shows is that when we lift up the economic status of women, we lift up the economic status of families, we lift up the economic status of communities. And in, and in short, we lift up the economic status of economies. So there is a significant benefit to having um, a sufficient and fair number of women in the workplace. So we know the data shows that when more women work, economies grow, okay? Women's employment boosts productivity, um, it increases economic diversification, and it improves equality. Um, and what we have seen here in the U.S. is that when we don't have 
significant numbers of women in the workplace. The, we are losing in the billions and the multi-billions um, in the economy. It's very significant. We've had, there, there are economists that have looked at this closely and just feel that it's absolutely silly for us not to invest in women. So we're seeing here that closing the gender gap could increase global GDP by 15%. Um, in the US, that number is even higher, we're seeing. Um, and companies, like I said, like explained in the last slide, companies benefit too. Companies benefit significantly. So um, in a recent um, McKinsey study, we're seeing that the, their analysis found that companies in the top quartile of gender diversity on executive teams were 25% more likely to experience above range profitability than their peer companies. They also found that 48 that um, there's a 48 percent performance differential um, between the most and the least gender diverse companies. So we're seeing that women bring value, women bring revenue, women bring profit. Okay, so we know that at the end of the day, the data shows the economist have studied this closely, shows that there is a significant benefit to having women in the workplace. So now I'm going to talk about the different challenges and opportunities um, that employers have um, to support women in the workplace and to deal with a lot of the issues that um, women are facing um, right now. So before I move on to the business case, Laura, I forgot to ask you, do you have anything to add? If you don't, that's cool. <laughs> no, I don't. Thank you for checking. Okay. No problem. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the challenges and the opportunities for employers. So um, both Laura and I had spent years at one of the largest companies in the world. Um, and during that time, we were, I was head of compliance for the largest 401k plan in existence and for one of the largest pension plans in existence globally. Um, and Laura was in charge of strategy for those plans. Um, so a lot of what we're going, to, we're taught, we've talked about and what we will talk about is just based on experience with just the largest sample group <laughs> that you could possibly take into account. Um, uh, globally across various countries. So let's talk about the global trends that we're seeing, the, what the data shows, and so just some of our personal experience dealing with um, large employers um, with very large pop employee populations. So we know that there's a significant pay gap between what men and women earn. So most, the most recent data says that it's about women earn around 77% of when, what men earn. Um, and that is, it's an even bigger gap um, in certain countries. Um, so that's a very significant challenge that women are facing. It's a significant issue and we're trying to close that gap. Um, part of the reason there's that significant gender gap is because there's underrepresentation of women in leadership. So when you don't have women in leadership, there, there aren't women to lift other women. There aren't women that understand the lived experience um, of the women coming up through the ranks in their companies um, to help them figure out what works in order for them to thrive. Um, to thrive in the company at work and to be advanced um, as they deserve. So there's underrepresentation in leadership, which leads to this pay gap. Um, they're also, with that pay gap, it means that at the end of the day, um, from a retirement perspective, when women eventually do retire, um, that they have significantly less retirement savings, okay? Um, and then in addition to that, they have a longer average lifespan 
Um, they're less likely to even have a pension in the first place because of job opportunities. Um, so you end up with women who are, who do not feel supported in the workforce and are also just financially behind. In addition to that, we're seeing, and we saw it in particular, and we're seeing it especially now um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, that childcare has basically become a pre prerequisite for work for women. So if they don't have childcare, it is almost impossible to actually be able to work. So we're seeing that that is a significant issue for women to be able to thrive in the workplace, um, is access to um, adequate parental leave when needed, and also affordable childcare and dependent care when needed. In addition to that, we're seeing globally that transportation, safe transportation, is also for uh, it's also an issue for women um, in certain areas. So what we're seeing with these unique challenges is that there are a number of different social issues in addition to issues within the workforce, a workplace, excuse me, that make it very difficult for women to advance to the levels that they should be advancing to and to remain in the workforce altogether. So I talked a little bit about COVID-19 and the impact that that has had. Um, when there is a global disaster, when there is some critical, terrible thing that happens in the world. It's the most vulnerable individuals that are, uh, that are most disproportionately impacted. And that's what we're seeing with the pandemic. Women who oftentimes lack adequate childcare, who oftentimes are the primary caregiver in their household for children and disabled family members or elderly parents are often the ones that are most significantly impacted when something occurs in the economy. Um, so we realize that particularly now, it's really important for us to focus on the, the specific challenges that women face outside of work, um, and inside of work because the intersectionality of work and life has become very real with this pandemic, very real. With people working from home, um, with people just juggling various issues, personal issues, work and life have really become intertwined and women are most significantly impacted um, by that intersection. So we want to talk about, oh, I wasn't expecting this to <laughs> load this way, so I apologize. So let's talk about, so we talked about the challenges. Um, and Laura, I don't know if you have any additional comments on the challenges. Okay, before I move forward. So now let's talk about the opportunities. Okay, the opportunities, opportunities that employers have um, to make a significant difference. So we're gonna start with recruiting women, okay? So when we think about role development, when we think about role development and job descriptions, we have to be very intentional. We have to be very intentional about what we expect, about allowing for flexibility, about making sure that our job descriptions, the way that we develop roles are inclusive. Making it, making sure that the role, when we're developing roles, that they're roles that women with families, with children, with other obligations would be able to fairly and equitably do and succeed and thrive within, okay? Then the next one is algorithms. So a lot of us in within big companies use all types of um, software um, for hiring. 
And study after study has shown that many of these algorithms that these soft that we uh, that we upload into this software can be biased. Um, and it's biased because the individuals who are creating the algorithms oftentimes just do not realize that they're creating an algorithm that may be biased against women or other diverse individuals. And you have to be very intentional about the way you set up your algorithms because it could end up kicking people, keep kicking women out in particular. Um, the interview process. So when we talk about the interview process, one, it's very important to show that your company is inclusive during the interview process. And then even when you start getting the resumes in, it's important to be intentional about looking at those resumes with an eye towards diversity. Um, we've study after study after study have shown that women with the exact same academic background, exact same work experience are less likely to be picked for a position than a man. And all they did in those studies was change the names. So we have to be intentional about those biases that we all have, that society has taught us to have, okay? So resumes and then the interview process that follows. We have to be intentional about what, what we're expecting um, and what our biases are. The next is benefits. So a lot of employers fail to understand how much benefits can really be a selling point, particularly for women. So for in different countries, there are different uh, requirements around, for example, paid leave, et cetera, things like that. However, caregiving benefits, um, additional paid leave days as necessary, flexible work environments, um, fair and equitable um, retirement plans. All of these can be very, very, very significant selling points for women who, uh, women who might have families, women who might want to eventually have a family to feel like they will be supported and be able to thrive in the workplace still, okay? Um, and then finally, department hiring goals. So here, I'm not talking about quotas. What we're talking about here is just being intentional about having diverse teams. So being intentional about balancing out the number of men and women that you have on your team. Being intentional about understanding that diversity makes you better, that diversity leads to innovation, that diversity leads to better outcomes. So, uh oh. So, in this next section, sorry, I hit it one too many times. In this next section, um, I want to talk about after recruiting, you have to think about um, the pipeline. So, you want to continue being able to recruit women. And oftentimes, we hear that, oh, no, there are not enough women software engineers, there are not enough women economists, there are not enough women um, in whatever field. There are, I promise. It's a matter of creating a pipeline and it's a matter of marketing your company in a manner that would make women want to come work for you, okay? So part of creating the pipeline is just marketing in itself. Get your company culture marketing clear. Get it inclusive. Make your company appear to be open and inviting and actually be open and inviting, okay? So um, some of the other aspects of creating a talent pool include community-based programs. So employ a lot of employers sponsor community-based programs that can start when that can start in elementary school or primary school um, all the way up to college or university. That basically creates a pool of women 
who would be interested in your company, who would be interested in studying certain areas so that they could come work for you in the future. Um, I already talked about university-based, same thing, creating, partnering with um, universities to create programs, to create internship programs, um, to create um, different uh, study areas, for example, very specific study areas, or even doing being an adjunct professor at a university to just create relationships and create those talent pools. And then finally, internal groups. So that means working at your company, women who are already working at your company and should be and could be advanced. Create a talent pool internally of women that you are molding for leadership positions, women that you are investing in for leadership positions. That's another great way to build a talent pool, um, to build a talent pool within your organization and to also keep women at your company because they know that there are opportunities for advancement um, at your organization or your company. So finally, with respect to opportunities, I just talked about marketing yourself as being inclusive, being welcoming, being flexible, being open, and, be, and really caring about diversity. You can market yourself as that, but here's the reality. Your company will create a revolving door if you actually are not inclusive and welcoming. So we're going to get into more detail on this inclusivity um, and Laura is going to talk through that. But what that means is essentially building your company culture or building your company culture through culture through um, equitable policies. So that's workplace um, practices and benefits design. We'll talk about that some more. Um, intentional focus on representation at all levels. So making sure that you have women in leadership, it's so important. Um, making sure that there are opportunities for advancement um, that's part of creating that pipeline, really making an investment in your women. Um, advocacy and allyship, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but that is definitely all around. We need women who make it into leadership to be advocates for other women, not to just take on the boys club culture of, uh, you have to work 24 hours. No, there's no time for you to go give your child a bath. You know, we can't do that. As women, we have to support other women. And men also have to stand up and support other women because we're seeing there's, men are the majority of leadership. And if you don't have leadership sponsorship, if you don't have leadership leading the way and being fully in support, then that really drives your culture at your company. Um, so now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Laura to get into more detail on creating an inclusive work culture and enhancing a woman's experience in the workplace. Thank you so much. And if you go to the next slide, which I started to see this up for me, um, there's really a two pronged approach to thinking about the ways in which you can make your company culture um, more, uh, or better support women in terms of representation, equity, and inclusion. One of those paths is really thinking about systems, looking at, again, the macro, very high level, what you can do to influence what's happening to women across your entire company. So not just women by women and not you know, interaction within, interaction by interaction within the course of every day, but what can you really do to change the way that things are working? So when we think about systems, we're talking about things like your company culture and your values. If you have values documented, um, it's important to the extent that you, you want to um, market this, talk about your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
or talk about how values relate to your culture and things that you think make your company one of the very unique places to work where women should also want to work. Uh, that values and culture in particular are, are things that the workforce is starting to pay a lot more attention to. And like, like Uche mentioned, it's, these are things that, that investors and customers are also paying more attention to. And they notice if you're silent on, on topics like diversity, equity, and inclusion, and particularly support for women. The other types of systems that we think about are the programs that are available for employees. So for example, any benefits programs that you offer, any training programs that you offer, are those built in an, built in an equitable way? Are they available to many types of employees regardless of their background? Or is there equitable access to those types of programs, et cetera? And we also think, think about policies and processes. So oh, policies are things like workplace flexibility. Does everyone um, who could reasonably work from home when they need to have the right to work from home when they need to? Or are there certain teams where even though the, the company policy overall might be that you can be flexible, the specific manager doesn't allow flexibility because not having consistent policies and not having policies that we know help support women and help keep them in the workplace can be really detrimental to providing that support that, that women may need. And so that might mean that a woman needs to log on early in the morning, take off a couple of hours and then log on later in the evening, or it might just mean needing to be home a couple of days a week when we're back in post COVID situations, when we're back in the office. Um, flexibility and other types of policies can mean a lot of different things. And you have to make policies that make sense for what your business does and what your employees are doing, but it's really important to be thoughtful and intentional about how you build those inclusively. And then with processes, that's really around some of the, the types of things that Uche walked us through in terms of defining how we're, how we're identifying candidates that we're recruiting, how we're, how we're going through interview processes, how we're going through just the standard operations of our day that we can enhance to better support women or any underrepresented group that we want to make sure that we're supporting. And then beyond the systems level, there are the things that we can do every day as individuals. Um, and these are really just things that can be built into what we do in our daily interactions. So there's the conversations that we have with team members. There's the awareness that we, that we um, drive ourselves to have around our own biases or biases that could be aware, that could be um, present in existing processes. Just working on trying to make things better. This is where things like outlet, like allyship fit in as well. Um, and within conversations, that's also where I would categorize things like providing mentorship to women or making sure that there are employee resource groups, for example, available for women employees and helping to retain employees. And especially if there are gaps within your, your talent strategy where you're really trying to find ways of recruiting and retaining particular types of diversity, you can really leverage benefits programs as a way to get people in the door and then to stay. So these types of benefits can be things like paired get, paid caregiver leave, um, additional flexibility or flexible holidays, uh, anything that really it, it helps everyone, but there are certain demographics, and in this case, women, that can really benefit from a particular program that you could add. Um, like we talked about already, there are opportunities to enhance hiring, staffing, and promotion processes. Um, particularly as it relates to promotions, it's incredibly important to make sure that you have 
documentation about how you determine who is eligible for a promotion, what makes someone qualified to be promoted, and that you, you're going through a fair and equitable process in terms of comparing candidates who could potentially be promoted and documenting why someone is being promoted versus why they're not, and really making sure that you have very solid um, uh, performance data information about what employees' goals are, whether they've met those goals, the more that you can really keep track of what employees are doing and what they have done and where they are on their, their progress to advancement makes a huge difference, one, in actually getting women into leadership, but two, helping to show that there's transparency around these processes and that the promotion process is actually fair because having that sense of transparency and having that sense of fairness helps that everyone feel like there is this overall culture that we've talked about in terms of um, being equitable, being inclusive, having equal opportunities, no matter what your background is, and that you're not going to be overlooked for a role that you deserve. We, you touched on flexibility a little bit already. Again, just anything that can be done to help employees be remote when they need to or take advantage, take, take care of personal priorities that they have, whether those are childcare responsibilities or elder care responsibilities or just general life management responsibilities. We all have things going on. Um, and the more that people feel like they are able to step away for a few minutes to take care of the things that are important, the more that they'll feel like they matter and that the culture supports them. And these all really feed into company culture. The way that you put these pieces together and the way that you communicate them and market them and make employees actually feel them um, really does a lot to just make it very clear what your culture is and help employees feel like that is where they belong and also helps potential employees, um, potential candidates feel like your organization is the place that they want to be because the culture is so strong. The other aspect of thinking about systems is understanding the data that you have available to you and really leveraging it to understand what types of challenges your particular workforce may be facing and where you may be able to fill some gaps. So one really critical area is understanding the demographics of your workforce. There's some very high level types of information that you can understand, such as where your employees are located, what types of um, different job codes they may fall into or different categories of the work that they do, et cetera. But if you dig deeper into that in terms of what percentage of them are women versus men, um, what percentage of them have been promoted at some point during their tenure at your company, how long each of these employees has been there, you really can start to understand and see different types of behavior and different types of just situations for employees, depending on what their um, particular demographic or situation is. And you may see that you have more turnover in one location than another, for example. And based on conversations with employees in that location or based on some things that you may know about there already, you may be able to put together some piece, put together the pieces as to why you're seeing that turnover and then better understand whether you can make some cultural adjustments or process or policy adjustments to make sure that you're supporting that location. And especially if you see a lot of turnover within particular demographics, like if a lot of women are leaving, for example, it's critical to understand that so that you can stop that, that outflow and start to build in policies that prevent what was happening previously. Another really critical area to understand in terms of demographics and using data is seeing how representation of women changes as you go up the, the corporate ladder. So are you at, let's say 50-50, 50% men, 50% women at entry level, are you still at 50% as you get to manager level? level? I would guess not. 
maybe if you're doing really well, you're close to 50%, the higher and higher and higher we get into organizations, the lower the percentage of women it tends to be. And that is something that we see globally. Um, like, like Uche mentioned, when we don't have the right uh, pipeline, when we don't have the right processes to make sure that women are being promoted and are getting credit for their work, it becomes harder and harder for them to advance. And so understanding what gaps you have baseline today in terms of where women are can really help you build a very thoughtful strategy about how to actually increase the number of women and help you understand where you might have some process issues, for example, around promotions where you could potentially make some adjustments that may not they, they may not cost you anything. They may not be that complicated to implement, but can make a really big difference in terms of getting women up the ladder. And that, like I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, really understanding the attrition that you're seeing across the, com the company. Um, I know globally because of COVID-19, attrition has just been up generally, but even knowing that attrition is up generally, you still can dive into some of the demographic data that is available to understand whether certain types of employees are leaving disproportionately compared to others. And again, and that's where things like benefits and policies can come in and help. And then one of the things that I think we probably don't do enough of, and it's the easiest one to do really, is to just talk to our employees. What are we doing? to you either solicit feedback through a survey especially right now given the pandemic it's probably more important now than ever to really understand how employees are feeling, what kinds of things they could be using support with. And we've seen throughout the pandemic that the types of things that employees need support with changes depending on what phase of the pandemic that we're in. And that's the, the pandemic is making some of these challenges really visible for people because so many people are experiencing so many change all at once. But on a more micro level, people face different challenges and different needs on a daily basis. Anyway, we're just seeing it in a much grander scale right now. But the more that we talk to employees, the more that we really ask and really try to listen to what it is that they need, the more that you can build programs, processes, policies, and procedures that make sense for your organization and that makes sense for what your employees are telling you that they need. And then if we go to the next Sorry, slide. Sorry, can I just add one more comment? Will... <laughs> Sorry. Oh, sure. Thank yeah. you. So just like Laura said, the importance of both quantitative and qualitative data. So the quantitative looking at, looking at numbers and understanding who's leaving when they're leaving. And then the, the, um, qual, the qual, uh, qual data, I'll just call it that, <laughs> quantitative, qualitative, the qualitative data. Why that's so important is because the quantitative data doesn't always show you the big picture. The quantitative data doesn't always allow you to dig deeper to understand what's going on. Because what we hear from our clients all the time is, we do have a flexible workspace, workplace. We do have caregiving benefits. We do have this, we do have that. But what, we'll, what we often find when we look at the employee surveys, when we look at the employee feedback, is you have to ask the right questions to, to know where your employees are in terms of their understanding. Oftentimes, you'll have employees that have no idea <laughs> that, that the company offers something. You'll have employees that literally have been looking for something, looking for a particular resource, looking for a particular time of benefit and type of benefit and literally had no idea that the company offered this because the company wasn't doing a good job of communicating. And you're not gonna know if you're not doing a good job of communicating unless you get feedback from your employees. So I just wanted to you know, hammer in the point that you need both 
the quantitative and the qualitative data to know what's going on to be able to support your employees. There are benefits in different programs and different resources that you can add, but sometimes you already have those things, but your employees just have no idea. I'll turn it back. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for thank you for mentioning that. Communications are so critically important, uh, and they're way easier and less expensive to do than adding a new program. So, to the extent that you have things available and you can communicate in a way that helps people quickly and easily understand what's available, um, and really understand how it can best support their specific situations, the more effective your programs will ultimately be. Here, we're going to shift to the second prong that I mentioned earlier, which is really focused on how your people, how your team members can support women on a daily basis. Um, this involves making sure that your employees understand what bias is and how bias can come into the workplace, specifically in processes like recruiting, hiring, interviews, promotions, et cetera, and give them some really specific tactical strategies for how bias can be interrupted. Sometimes that's simply making sure that interview panels, the people who are actually interviewing candidates are, are um, diverse themselves. So you have a couple of women who are interviewing or who are on the interview panel and a couple of men rather than a full panel of men. Um, that's those are the types of kind of easy ways of interrupting bias that can really ensure that when you're going through these critical processes, like determining who you're going to hire, you're giving the candidate a fair shot and you're also giving them a fair representation of what your company looks like, who they would be working with. And when you have diverse people who are answering questions and providing questions, it gives the candidate more information about the company that they're entering as well. Another space that's very important that doesn't get as much attention is just making sure that when someone does good work, and especially when women do good work, making sure that they're getting credit for that. So that could mean um, having managers specifically share in team meetings, special projects, or great high quality work that women have completed, or making sure that if a manager is presenting one of their team members projects on behalf of their team member, that they're actually specifying who did the work, who um, created the deck, who did the research, who came up with the strategy to make sure that whoever is presenting isn't just by default being attributed the credit. Um, we see a lot that women are not given as much credit as their their men counterparts are sometimes. So this, and this again is a really easy thing that you can do where you can just speak up and say, hey, did you know that Uche did this really great presentation um, a couple of weeks ago? I just wanna make sure everyone on the team knows that she did that. Um, and that can really add to a positive corporate culture as well. So being as a mentor or a champion for women is something that's very powerful too, especially if you're a leader. Um, and mentors and champions can be men, they can be women, but anyone who is willing to um, really pull a woman along, um, whether they're a junior, whether they're mid-career, no matter where they are, anything that you can do to help connect them with um, the right resources from a networking perspective or from a education perspective to make sure that they understand this, the subject matter for a role that they may want to move into or the responsibilities for a role that they may want to move into. Helping connect those dots as much as possible and giving them coaching about the ways in which they can be successful at your company will make a huge difference in terms of whether they are actually successful. And then, again, one of the easier things to do, and maybe it doesn't feel easy until you started, but once you start having conversations around this and really being transparent and being open about the fact that you want to support women and you want to be intentional in increasing representation, equity, and inclusion, 
you keep that conversation going. So to the extent that you can provide some progress on the gains that you're making, or you can provide information about what your strategy is, how you're working to achieve it, the more that you'll be seen as doing this work very authentically, and the more that people will want to be involved and volunteer to helping mentors or help redesign or enhance some of the processes that you have in place. The more people that you have doing this work, the more that it just becomes second nature and it really truly becomes part of your daily process and the things that you're doing with everyone and everything that you do. And at ALO, that those those are the types of things that we really focus on. What can we do that helps big picture, that isn't a huge lift for people, that can really make a big difference? Then going to the next slide, we wanted to just really quickly, well, first of all, Uche, did you have anything else you wanted to add there? Only to say, <laughs> I always have something to say. I'm a lawyer, so sorry, <laughs> I did too much. Um, <laughs> the one thing I wanted to add is that another misconception that employers have is that, oh, if you give if you create more flexible work environments in terms of hours, the number of hours or the hours when people actually work, studies have shown that when women are given flexibility, that oftentimes they will get the same work done at, at the same quality or higher quality, actually in less time. So that's another reason that having structures in place, having systems in place that are fair um, for example, with respect to advancement and promotions, if you focus on the actual results and what women are accomplishing and not all of the other just toxic cultural things, you'll find that women are, women, women give you good results <laughs> in with everything else that they're dealing with. And oftentimes with less time, the results are the same or better. So I just wanted to add that. <laughs> For instance, let's say when um, you might have a case of a manager that replies, uh, uh, okay, we just hire the professional that fits for the job, no matter. Good, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Just one more. So this final slide. Go ahead, Laura. Sorry, Mickey, we have just one more piece. <laughs> uh, yeah. Go ahead, Laura. Sorry, Mickey, we have just one more. Uh, Mickey, you're breaking up a little bit. Can you repeat what you said? Don't worry, don't worry. You can, uh, you can go ahead. I will ask later. Okay. Just, yeah, just, this is our final slide. Thank you. Uh, we wanted to wrap up before we dive into the questions that you all had. Um, just wanted to share a little bit more about our approach and the ways in which we help companies think about and apply these concepts in ways that make sense to them. So we partner with large organizations globally um, to help leaders there really think about what their own diversity, equity, and inclusion strengths and, and opportunities are, and thinking about what kinds of improvements they may want to make in a way that feels authentic and correct for them for where they're operating, uh, what their overall talent strategy is, what their goals are in terms of increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion, really building a tailored approach to building a solution and, and strategy that makes sense. Uh, we also do a lot of work thinking about uh, or evaluating the per programs, policies, and communications that employers have in place so that we then can work on making enhancements that further diversity, equity, and inclusion. And related to that, we find ways to help optimize the cost of the programs that employers have in place, particularly around benefits and wellness programs. Uh, we know from experience leading strategy at one of the largest global companies in the world that benefits programs are incredibly expensive, incredibly time consuming to evaluate and administer. And, and if employees don't understand them and don't use them, 
the money that is spent on those programs is not being used efficiently. So we find ways to help better uh, connect benefits to employees and really help employers get the most out of what they're spending on, on those types of programs, which helps the bottom line, but also helps them with employee engagement because when employees know that benefits are available and they take advantage of them and they feel supported by their company, they're much more likely to stay. They're much more likely to be engaged. And we all know that turnover can be incredibly expensive. And then finally, just really want to hit home that everything that we do is tailored and customized to what our clients need. We think a lot about what the particularities are of a company's culture and what their priorities are and find a solution that fits those particular needs uh, really through a close partnership with, with the leaders uh, across the organization. Uh, and, and we just, we love working with employers across the world uh, on all these different topics. We're both very passionate about supporting all employees and especially finding ways to enhance talent strategy around diversity, equity, and inclusion topics. So we would love to speak to any of you um, first through any questions that you have right now and then following this presentation as well. Nusha, do you have any final thoughts before we get into questions? Well, we have about two minutes left, so I don't have any final thoughts. Oh. I think I've talked enough. <laughs> okay. So maybe Thank I you. will. Are there any questions? <laughs> Thank you a lot. Thank you, Laura and Luce, for delivering such a very rich presentation, very complex. You touch uh, several topics that uh, are very much interesting right now, even, even in Italian, I would say all over the world, uh, especially in, in Thailand. Uh, this could be also interesting to develop some uh, uh, round table uh, related to this. Uh, I would like to also to involve uh, some of the audience, let's say if everyone would like to, to add something, uh, uh, you can have reaction, you can raise your hand by clicking if you want. But for example, before I was saying, uh, now can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for example, um, in an environment uh, in which uh, you have a manager replying to, or oh, we just promote, we we promote the best uh, candidate, we promote the best professional, uh, no matter uh, regardless of the gender. Sometimes you might have like uh, this type of reply uh, in case you 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 promote uh, maybe like the same group of people, the same group of professionals. Um, but let's say how you counteract this such uh, type of reply in, uh, is my question clear? Sure. Yes, so in quick 30 seconds, I'll try to answer this question. So one, we have to change our mindset about um, diverse employees, women being qualified or not qualified because we don't talk about men in the um, context of being qualified or not qualified. So that's the first thing. And that comes from a place of bias, which is often um, comes from just having a hom homogenous group. So the same group of males, for example, that may have certain biases, may have a, pers a certain lived experience. And because of that, um, might see that a man might have a bias in thinking that a man might be more qualified than a woman who has the same experience, the same qualifications. We've seen that in study after study, study that resumes with the, same, with the same information, just a male name and a female name get treated differently. So this is why you need women in leadership. This is why you need diverse teams of people um, reviewing applications and um, interviewing candidates because that's often the argument that's made when you have a certain mindset of whether someone is qualified um, or not qualified. In addition to that, it's important to create talent pools like we talked about to actually, when you're recruiting, before you bring someone in the door, before you see any resumes, to really make sure 
that the roles you're creating are inclusive to women, that the way that you're marketing your company are inclusive to women. So there are women out there who are ready to come in and do good work. It's about do taking the right steps to get women in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one other topic would be uh, right now we are living uh, this pandemic. Uh, let's say some country is experiences is experiencing a worse situation than other. Uh, Thailand, let's say, compared to other countries, uh, is uh, pretty safe. Even if some company, uh, even actually ourselves, uh, we need to split the team just to be safe. Uh, but in some other areas, uh, you really work from home. In such a situation, let's say in a big corporation or a small, medium company, uh, how do you uh, still uh, include uh, the cultural diversity in the company? How can you involve uh, uh, your employees uh, that might be separated from, uh, let's say, the normal daily office hours? Uh, this is a challenge to keep also the team uh, cooperating together. We experienced also last year as, a, as a, my office, as a chamber, we experienced this. And what do you suggest uh, in this case? What is your view? Uh, it, it's really helpful for teams to come together on some kind of regular basis to just connect and have some casual conversations. I think we all miss, well, those of us in the U.S. haven't been in the office for a very long time. <laughs> um, but when we're not in the office, we miss some of those casual conversations. And sometimes those casual conversations are where... Um, some of the uh, challenges that employees are facing come up that can then be heard by leaders or addressed by leaders. And so going back to what I said uh, a little bit ago about talking to employees and hearing what is on their mind, um, whether that's through some small team meetings on, you know, maybe on a weekly basis or uh, every couple of days, or through surveys, anything that you can do to help people feel like they still have these ways to connect and that someone is listening to their needs and especially how their needs may be changing because of the pandemic, the more that people will continue to feel engaged. Uh, and another thing that I think is really important and that we didn't talk about too much today is mental health and really understanding that many people are going through many more challenges right now because of the pandemic than they do uh, in a normal year or in a normal day. So trying to provide more flexibility and just understanding that we all are managing our work and our life in the same space all day uh, and just being patient about that and understanding that we all have different commitments that we need to meet. That's a challenge that we are living uh, almost daily. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, because uh, uh, maybe you haven't you haven't had the chance yet to, to visit Thailand. But for example, what we see in Thailand, uh, um, the country tried to invest a lot in education. I believe, like education, educating um, children uh, in having a, a let's say a more flexible and uh, encouraging people to be welcoming. Uh, will uh, create a professional that is also more engaging to no matter the gender or, or sexual orientation, at the age also, and so on. Um, Thailand is trying to invest a lot, and uh, uh, if you happen to, to visit Thailand, you will see that there are, uh, I would say, hundreds of international schools uh, with different backgrounds. They have uh, maybe uh, American, like United States oriented education, or British, that is very famous uh, here, uh, even from Australia, and uh, families struggle to pay to pay the fees for the, the schools. So they're very expensive. Like they, we might uh, relate those international schools since elementary school up to uh, high school or a private university, uh, like the uh, same system you have in the United States. So you might be paying uh, 50,000 US dollars per year for one kid. So it's very demanding. But of course, families struggle to give better education, to allow the, the, their kids to learn uh, several different languages uh, because uh, 
they want them to be successful, especially in a country uh, in a country that is surrounded by several competitors. Like Southeast Asia is uh, a, an economic community, but still uh, we're talking about uh, uh, 10 countries uh, with uh, uh, the big presence of uh, uh, a hefty neighbor like mainland China investments, for example. And so this, this, uh, this uh, future working community must be engaged and be ready to face international environment. Uh, I believe that uh, the topic that you touch, like supporting women in workplace, is also very important to stress uh, for several uh, uh, big corporation, but also small medium enterprises that are aiming to export internationally. And we talk to this type of companies daily, in our case as Italian Chamber of Commerce, to send them to Italy or Europe. Uh, but I believe that education is also a key point. What, what do you think about that? Education is huge. Um, education is huge and starting early is huge. Um, and I think that the, we are also seeing the next generation of employees coming into the workplace. In the US, we call them Generation Z. Um, that is a lot more vocal about diversity and inclusion, a lot more vocal about being supportive of people who are not like them, um, a lot more vocal about their employers that do not practice what they preach if they're talking about diversity and inclusion actually having a culture of diversity and inclusion so it's important it's definitely important to start early with teaching people how to be open and inclusive and i think with just our globalized world that like i said this new generation is coming into the workplace and they have a different view the status quo is not enough anymore so Gen Z women coming into the workplace, they want to see that the employer is actually inclusive, actually supportive, actually creating a place where they can thrive, actually creating a place where they can advance. And if that does not occur, there's no more, oh, I'll deal with it and never get promoted, or I'll deal with it and just work all day, every day, even though I have responsibilities that I'm expected to cover at home. Now, women are saying, no, this isn't okay. I'll go to another company that treats me well, that supports me, that allows me to thrive. So you're exactly right that education is important. The new globalized world is bringing in a new generation of very of, of more open minds. Um, and the new globalized world is bringing in a generation that's a lot more vocal about their employers and how they're treated. Um, so absolutely agree. Employers really, really have to understand that um, the world is changing. People care now. Absolutely. Of course, investing in human capital, it's, uh, it's vital nowadays. Uh, Thailand... Um... Uh, let's say before COVID, uh, Thailand declared to have only 1% of unemployment rate, which is very, uh, let's say, very unusual. Of course, during COVID, uh, this country, for example, lost uh, millions of tourists and millions of uh, business people come here for developing business. So let's say right now the situation is different, but um, we experienced before a, a high turnover of uh, employees. As you said, as you mentioned, Uche, uh, I can move uh, for even 30 US dollar more. I will move to another company. If you give me just a little amount of money, I will move. I don't care. Uh, but the reason some people stay in the company is that the company will give you benefit, will take care of you. Uh, so this one is also very important, like being flexible, uh, providing them uh, with, uh, let's say, basic benefit also. And I believe that uh, in nowadays, especially because of the pandemic that we are experiencing all over the world, uh, it's becoming more demanding for every company to keep uh, as much as long as you can, of course, the good professional that are cooperating for the benefit of your of your company. But let's say an happy employer, an happy employee, uh, 
is wealthy for his own family, for his own group of people, for his own kin. So it's very important to, especially now, uh, try to build up a good professional and uh, because we have families <laughs> in the end. So let's say you build up a better society. Absolutely okay. agree. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't see many many questions from uh, from our audience, but and yeah, I want to uh, reassure everyone that uh, uh, if possible, uh, we can share a, the presentation or let's say part of the presentation if you allow us to to spread it or let's say make it downloadable for our website. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, yeah. absolutely. We can do that. <laughs> okay, so we will uh, also facilitate uh, our network of companies to contact you, uh, so you can give us the email that you prefer to um, uh, display. So we will uh, make sure, like, we circulate the, the registration of today among our partners. I would like to also thank. I, I forgot at the very beginning. I would like to thank also the Joint Foreign Chamber of Commerce of Thailand which is our big association we belong to. Uh, we are counting over 35 bilateral chamber of commerce in Thailand. So it's pretty lively. And also the TIBA uh, is a Thailand European Business Association, uh, the Franco Thai Chamber of Commerce, uh, and also would like to thank uh, Sara uh, of Women Entrepreneurs Brand uh, based in Bangkok to promote the webinars among our uh, team of entrepreneurs. Uh, anyhow, um, Thank you again, Laura and Uche. Thank you so, so much for having us. Um, and we look forward to any questions that you may have. Please feel free to reach out to us um, if you have any questions. And just as a reminder, we are global um, and our experience and our clients are global. So if you have any questions, we're happy to talk, answer them, um, whatever you need. Thank you so much for having us. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Thank, and, you. Uh, thank you again. And for everyone in, um, in the audience, we will uh, display very soon the presentation. And check uh, Nelu Solution online if you are in hurry. And uh, you can have a chat with the team of Uche and Laura. OK, and thank you Michele, again. Michele, sorry, just wanted to say, this is Sara, just wanted to say thank you and a great presentation to uh, Nelu. We'll be in touch uh, for a future uh, opportunities to to um, collect. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day, everyone, or a good night for Laura and Uche. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you, you again. Too. Have a, a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Bye bye.